Yes, can hear you, Mackenzie. Can hear you, Mickey. Um, all right. Um, let me. I want to welcome you all to our Longmont public uh, hearings for our human services funding. As you know, these are it's being recorded because this is technically a public hearing and is available to the public. In fact, we have a member of the public who uh, is joining us today. Uh, Chet is 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 considering joining the board, um, and so um, he is a member of the public and just going to listen in. Um, we have our three board members, Robert, Deanna, and Brian, um, joining us as well. Uh, so as a reminder of how this works, we will be, it's pretty much a Q and A. And what we've been doing consistently with agencies that are applying for two programs, uh, we've been giving them 10 minutes each for each program. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the, the, the time of the, you know, the 20 minutes, if you have something else that you want to share, we allow you to do that as well. Um, and so I I think we want to start with, but before we do that, my apologies, I'll let, I want to make sure I let you all introduce yourselves. I will be the time here, but as, uh, after, you, after you introduce yourselves, we'll go ahead and get started. Would you like me to start, Eliberto? Uh, either one is fine. Cool. My name is Mickey Davis. I am the local food access specialist at Boulder County Farmers Markets. Um, this is my third Longmont hearing. Um, so I'm excited to answer your questions and tell you more about our programs. I would like to say that uh, I, I do editorial cartoons for a number of newspapers in the West. And farmers markets have been growing virtually in every town that I do work on as a farmer's market. It, it's, it's a remarkable thing that's happened. And now I, I'm going to ask you a question. Some of the farmer's markets actually have beer because it's organic. <laughs> it's locally made, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Do, this, you know, is that a possibility I mean, to have beer? I'll let Mackenzie, our new executive director, take that one. Robert, I love that question. And I would just introduce myself by saying I'm Mackenzie Selke. I'm the brand new executive director of Boulder County Farmers Markets. And I'm happy to report that our Wednesday Farmers Market does offer a very vibrant beer garden. We also have a local wine producer. In oh, really? And we also have a couple of uh, local distilleries that are with us at the Farmers Market. So Farmers markets are an incredible community resource. We invite you all to come down and check them out anytime. Thank you very much. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started with Q&A, start with the early childhood uh, piece. Um, and I'm also gonna timer right now. Does anybody have any questions or do you want me to start off with some questions? I can start then. Um, so let me I'll start with I'll start by putting a caveat um to my questions, Mackenzie and Mickey. So when we review your applications, both the board and staff review the exact same application. That being said, and and we each of our roles is different and our questions are different. Uh the board primarily reviews program level questions, not that they can't ask agency level questions, but their primary role is to look at the program, make sure it fits within our priority areas, et cetera. My role as staff is to look at a couple of important things. One, the overall strategic planning, you, making sure there's no duplication, that kind of stuff, which is all in question one. And then two, um, looking at, at board diversity, and we're gonna talk about that tonight. And then three, looking at the finances of both the, the nonprofit and also looking at um, you know how this program is being funded and what is the expectation of Longmont uh, taxpayer dollars for this program. So I'm gonna ask questions on all those levels tonight. I just wanted to caveat say that that's, that's my role. The board has other roles and has other questions. So first question I'm gonna start off with is, you know, when I read the application, I mean, I, I see what your overall mission is and, you know, increasing 
local access to food, increasing the, yeah, I, I, I understand that. But what I didn't see, and I'd love to hear from you, your thoughts on is, you know, what are some of, you know, we've had conversations both at site visits and, and in these meetings about the future of the organization. You're a 501c4. We've talked about a 501c3 um, to expand your, your, your diversity of funding. I didn't see any of that in the in the in the agency level strategic goals. So I'd like to hear from you all where the board is or where you are all at with that piece. Well, it'd be my pleasure to start this conversation um, by saying that the board is currently in the process of applying for 501c3 status. So I'm really happy to report that in this group and would just note that Boulder County Farmers Markets has been around for 35 years, but has gone through a leadership change and has a new leader in me as of April 2022. And so these last six months with the organization have been really focused um, for me and for the board and getting to know each other, getting to know our producers and our customers in um, post-pandemic, if there is post-pandemic uh, time and looking at what we want to do together in the coming months and weeks and years. And 501c3 status has been a priority for the board for a number of years, but is currently elevated to the level of actually working through the application. So we intend to submit materials to the IRS before the end of the year. Awesome. Do you have any other strategic goals that you that you want to share? Eliberto, I might just add to that specifically um, in terms of funding for the ECE programming. Um, we this may not have been included in the application, but we we are excited to be partnering with the Sustainability Fund um, to support ECE programming in. Longmont and sort of like greater Boulder County. We also found a good um, private donor this year, the Dodge Family Foundation for um, oh, good. for that program. So that's good. That's good to hear because that was one of my other questions when I look at when I look at the project budget. But we'll get to that. Yes, uh, it's, it's good to to see that uh, to hear that. Um, so before any any other strategic goals that you want to share. I would say that we're in a strategic planning phase of the okay. organization just with new leadership. So it's something that we're digging into both with our members and our customers and our board and with our food access experts and community members around where we want to be emphasizing um, different elements of the organization in the coming years. Okay, thank you. And then my next question, and, and board, if you all have a question, you could always just jump in or raise your hand and I'll stop. I just have... You know, I have questions around my areas. Um, then the other piece I had was, you know, as I, I read the work that you're doing, and I know you you have lots of partners in doing it. Um, who are your, who, who would you consider your principal partners in Longmont with your ECE work? So our partner at Boulder County Public Health, Heather Houseworth, does all of the coordination with the child care centers, the 25 centers that we serve in Longmont. So um, that's kind of the way we um, divide the, you know, the roles of this programming. We are the farmer facing agency. Um, we deal and manage all the logistics of uh, sourcing produce from 30 farmers, packing it in bags, making sure the correct education material is going in it, and then orchestrating its delivery every week. Um, and Heather is the, um, yeah, the child care center facing partner who, um, you know, brings us feedback from the centers. We want to be seeing more of this, or could we um, shift to, you know, could this center get a few more bags this week and this center getting less? So um, she's been working with us, the same 25 child care centers for at least a year now. Um, 
and they are all listed in that application. Um, and I think our, our ability to expand the program is really just dependent on funding. Um, so yeah, we prioritize the, the centers in Longmont that are serving the highest need population. Yeah, and I'll get that. I said I do have some funding questions that I want to get to, but before I go there, my last question around the agency level stuff uh, is, you know, I know this has been a conversation for a while, both in site visits uh, um, and in these meetings, uh, we've had this question, uh, but I really haven't seen that shift in the diversity of the board. I just want to check in on what's the work going on in there and what's the challenges that you've been facing? I would start by saying that we're recruiting for our board starting in November. So we have some open board chair seats and are looking at new members and thinking about the right mix for 2023, 24. Um, that's an exciting process. For me, it's a new one with Boulder County Farmers Market. The mission of our organization is such that we feel strongly that we are membership driven and the makeup of farmers and producers in Colorado and here in the Front Range, the folks who are members of our um, organization at BCFM happen to be um, a certain demographic. And we think a lot about diversity in farmers and think a lot about what we can do to make, um, make opportunities available to more diverse farmers and producers at the market and at our board. One of the conversations we're having right now is the possibility of looking at everything from scheduling and timing of board meetings to potential stipends available to board members to make it a more accessible um, experience for folks. It is, as we are considering strategic planning, part of the work that our board chair, Chris Ann Christensen, is helping lead. Um, and I think an exciting opportunity for us to continue to push ourselves and think about not only board, but advisory boards, like the one that Mickey uh, chairs for food access as a potential opportunity for increasing the number of voices who are in our leadership community. Okay. Oh, thank you. I just think I know it's important to us. And I know that we've had this conversation before. So that's why I'm checking in. So we have very little time for this one. But before I shift uh, to talk about the WIC program, you know, one of the things that I look at too, um, I'm not sure if the board looks at it, but one of the things that I look at is when, especially in your project budget and the way that I understand it and to, to Mickey's earlier point is, you know, if at least the way that project budget is written on the expense side, and maybe it's wrong, but and I'd like, to, like for you all to look at that and, and think about that. Um, what was sent to us shows long, there's, there's four columns, right? Or four or five columns, Boulder County, City of Longmont, City of Boulder, and then other funders. And what I didn't see was any other funding for this program. And so basically 100% of the funding for this program is coming from Longmont. And I just feel that that's a concern for me. And I've shared that concern before um, that, you know, typically, and I've told board, board and I've told, you know, I, I I'm concerned when over 20% of funding is coming from the city of Longmont for any program. So when 100%, if, if that is accurate, if 100%, that's a concern. So, yeah, and this is helpful for me just in, you know, how to write the application. All of our, all of our programs are run from single year grant applications. So, we don't have any multi-year grants that we currently um, have received to run these programs for, for multiple years. So um, by the time the application is due, we're, we're still, well, we don't have any certainty about what will be funded the next year. What we have learned recently in the past few weeks is that um, it's looking promising that we will have uh, support from the sustainability tax fund, um, which is currently being used to cover the, the gap for the WIC, um, for the farmer's market WIC program, um, that can be used to support the gap for city of Longmont. 
Um, this year we received funding from the Dodge Family Foundation and it's looking promising that they will support the gap in the city of Longmont as well as um, programming in Boulder County. All right, thank you. So our time is up for um, uh, ECE. So, and since you started having the conversation and, um, you know, basically I, I, you've already answered my other questions that I was gonna ask about the, the WIC, because again, I'm at the agency level, not the program level, but I'm gonna start with the same question, right? So it's a hundred, you're asking for $178,000, um, which is one, a huge jump from last year. Uh, and then two, when I look at, that project budget, we are way over 50% of the funding for that project budget on the expense side. And so that that is also very concerning to me. One, I'm concerned because of the amount. And then two, I'm concerned about um, you know, how much of that is represented by human service, long run human services funding. So yeah, our request increased by $11,000 this year. And that's mostly um, to cover the, so what we've seen this year with Longmont WIC um, is that more than 50% of the WIC families who utilize this program um, were utilizing the home delivery program. So when we uh, created our application for the 2022 year, we were not expecting that. We were thinking that most Longmont WIC families would go to the farmer's market and utilize our voucher program there. Um, so yeah, the increased ask is um, just seeing what the city of Longmont is able to support in terms of some of those extra fees associated with direct costs of packing out bags. So that's the physical bag itself, you know, printer ink, labels, things like that. Um, and we have talked about this before, but, and, you know, this is always, you know, this can be tweaked the way we write our application. Um, we just wanna show the city of Longmont how big we expect this program to be. Um, we are grateful to receive whatever funding, um, you know, this agency is able to give, uh, but we do want to see, want you to see the, the full scope of the whole program. Um, we're happy to change the way we write the application though, um, to be, you know, perhaps a bit more realistic with what we expect to, to get based off of um, prior year funding. Right. Well, I mean, I, I totally get, um, you know, showing the cost of the program. You should always show the cost of the program. I, I think the concern again is for me when, I, when I'm evaluating these is, you know, when, when so much is expected of the human services, we, we only get a certain amount of funding for all of the applications, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? So I guess that that's just my only point. Um, yeah. I, I, I think it is important to show that this is what the program costs because that's what the program costs. Yeah. I'm just sharing and, my concerns about that, my questions. That is heard. Um, and I would just go back to, you know, all of the funding. We hear about the funding decisions for all of our programs in December, January, and February. Um, so at the time of writing the application, we're not sure um, specifically uh, what we'll get from, from each agency. So um, I can say, um, you know, Right now, it's looking promising that we'll have some support again from the sustainability fund or the sustainability tax fund, like I mentioned, um, as well as support from uh, Nourish Colorado uh, gave us $50,000, much of which was used for City of Longmont WIC resident home deliveries, which is wonderful. So, and that actually brings up another question. Actually, I'm, I'm going to overstep my bounds and go a little bit to the program piece. Um, so I totally understand why home deliveries were started um, in the middle of the pandemic. That makes total sense. Mm -hmm. But here, I mean, here, you know, part of the farmer's market experience and the community building and the, you know, just the connect, I mean, part of your mission is really to connect the community with their local food growing 
and 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 so I'm I mean this is just a question for you all to think about but is is continuing this home delivery is that almost anti anti your mission I'm just I, it just came to me right now. Sorry, I just thought about, I don't know how to, how to say no, it right. No, I'm but. so glad you asked this because we've been thinking about this a lot too. Um, and what we did this year was really um, restrict, restrict might be the wrong word, but um, just really try to make it clear in our messaging that the home delivery program is strictly for folks who are not able to make it to the farmer's market otherwise. Um, so when they fill out that request order form to start receiving these deliveries, um, they give a reason why. And by and large, um, you know, I would say more than 50% of people had two reasons why they couldn't come to the market and they were lack of transportation or that they work during the time of the market. Um, so um, what, we, what we found with a little bit more digging is that the population that we are serving with this home delivery program is far and away more diverse. Um, they are households with more people in them. Um, and they're really the population that needs food assistance support the most. So um, the rules have always been, you know, either the farmer's market or the home delivery. But what we're finding with the home delivery is not only that we're reaching um, the population that has the most need, but also that we're more able to equitably distribute um, the sales to farmers across farmers that are based in Longmont, farmers that are farming sustainably. Um, whereas, you know, with the voucher program at market, we see that there are four vendors that receive over half of the, the vouchers that we distribute. So um, in certain ways, we're not able to do that, you know, physical community connection that we love about the farmer's market. But in other ways, we are, you know, reaching the target target population better and serving the mission of our programming better. So just a little bit of, uh, you know, inspection that we did this year um, with thinking about what, you know, where we want to go with this home delivery program. Okay. And I'm sorry, board. I know I took up a lot of the question time. If you, if you all have questions, if you free for free yeah, I just had a I just had several questions that I need to ask. So I'll turn it over to the board if they have any any other thoughts or questions as well. Robert, go ahead. Um I've noticed in the papers that uh, people who are visiting restaurants or flying airplanes have become are angry or combative or cranky or whatever you want to call it. Is that happening in the farmer's market too, that you're seeing people who are more competitive or angrier or something? And is it, would it be necessary to get some sort of police protection or something if, if that's the case? Robert, that's thank you for asking that question. And what I would say is that whenever I am feeling worried or weary about the world, I love to go and visit the farmer's markets. And that's sort of as corny and sentimental as it sounds, but it's also, I think, one of the most amazing public spaces that currently exist in our community. You can really spend time meeting your neighbors, having a conversation, or just being in public with your community members in a way that feels easy and simple and welcoming. You know, we hear from our food access customers regularly because Nikki does a lot of surveying of folks about their experiences. And we hear from folks that they feel welcome and that they feel part of something when they come to the farmer's markets. And it's certainly been my experience and is my experience hearing from the majority of our customers and vendors that one of the things they love most about being in person and have appreciated about this year in particular is just that ability to get together. So it's not always perfect, but it is one of, I think, the greatest um, 
just being together experiences that you can have in a public place in Longmont. I do enjoy going. We we don't have a lot of time left, but here's here's a suggestion that I would think about for maybe next year is because as I've been listening to the conversation and thinking about, you know, who you work with, you know, it would be nice to maybe have a, a Boulder County health person at this application hearing. Uh, because, you know, we can't really, I'm not sure how engaged you are with the WIC clients, right? Because ultimately, your customers are the farmers mark, the farmers, right? Ultimately, that is your membership. But for this grant and for the human services funding, our customers and our clients are our low and moderate income families and individuals in Longmont. And I love to hear, you know, I mean, of course, I get your reports and I appreciate those, but just would love to hear kind of like how, um, how that interaction happens, right? And it sounds like BCPH is more on that side of the of the app of the of this work. Is that is that I correct? Say, I would say that's accurate for our farm to early care and education programming. Okay. But I do all the direct communication with our WIC and okay. customers. Yeah. So um yeah I coordinate all of the names and addresses for our weekly deliveries. I read every feedback form that's submitted every week. Oh, good. Um, I send out the survey results and I do the analysis on them. So um, yeah, I have a lot of direct contact with um, the population. I also manage the monthly food access advisory board meetings. Um, so that's sort of a more long form way to get um, you know, to hear people's stories and experiences about what's happening at the market. And then okay. I manage four staff who are doing the transactions every week um, and they're giving me feedback all the time. So what are you hearing? Well, we always hear that people love this program. What we're hearing a lot this year is that the price of food and the price of gas is leveling people. Um, you know, I'm, that's just, that's not news, right? Um, but that this program is now more important even maybe than in the COVID years, just due to um, inflation right now. That's one big piece of feedback. But um, I think I included some testimonials in our um, uh, application, but I am more than happy to give more. People talk about health improvements they've had. A lot of people talk about the way their kids are excited to try new vegetables, which we know sets them up for a lifetime of health. Um, a lot of folks are um, talk about the way coming to the farmer's market reduces their uh, stress levels. Um, and the home delivery program is just life-saving. One person said it's the best program it's the best government program from which they receive support, which we thought was pretty special. Awesome. So technically our time is up. Um, I really, uh, yeah, I really appreciate Mackenzie and Mickey, your time. Um, and uh, I know I asked some tough questions tonight and, uh, but I, I appreciate your answers and, and thank you for all that you do for our Longmont residents, our, our WIC families, our early childhood centers. Um, I, I appreciate that. It's always a pleasure, Eliberto. Thank you so much. And so nice to meet all of you. Yeah, thank you for your partnership. We really, it means a lot to us as to the residents of Longmont. Does the board have any last questions or? No, okay. All right, have a good rest of your night. Do you Bye. Yeah, I just, um, I just want to make sure I, I keep consistent. We've been giving each agent when they do two to 10 minutes. I mean, we technically have more time, but I just wanted to stay consistent with with uh, how we've been doing it. So it's, it's um, yeah, we had, we had, the timer had gone off. So we got, a, a, we have about eight minutes before our next agency. So this is the perfect time for a bio break if needed. We'll, we'll leave the recording going. Um, I will go off camera and go get a glass of water myself. So I'll see you all here in about eight minutes at 640. We have a community food share next. Thanks, Alberto. Okay.
All right, I am back. Um, but we still got a little couple, a few more minutes. Um, I just had to go get a glass of water. Oh, it looks like Chet dropped off. Is he coming back? He didn't say anything to me. Um, I stepped away as well, but. Okay, that's fine. You know, he's come to two, so he, he's, I think he's got a good picture of how it works. Uh, there's another person. Her name is Crystal, uh, and she's interested. I thought she, I, we, we invited her to come tonight, but I, I don't think she was able to join us, or at least not yet. Um, but I think she'd be a great um, a great representative. So I like, I, like I said in my email, we're still looking for more great candidates. So if you all have any, that would be awesome. Um, uh, Crystal is a, Lat is, is a Latina, which is great. And um, she works at EFAS in Boulder. So she really has a good pulse on, on you know, the human services needs and, and what people are facing, challenges that our families are facing. So I look forward to, if she does apply, I look forward to hopefully having her on the board. She sounds like an ideal candidate, Eliberto. We're going to miss you, Brian, and your voice. So yes. She's getting gas. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll give her a, a list of bad jokes. Sure. <laughs> All right, so it is 639. I think we can allow uh, Alexandra and Kim from the Community Food Share. Um, yeah, we can let them in. And, I can't see me. There we are. Hey, you are. I like better. I can't. Hello. Hello. There we are. There we go. Uh, so welcome. I'm just gonna go over some housekeeping items just so you all all know what you're what we're going to do tonight. Um, as usual, this is a public hearing. It is being recorded and will be available on YouTube. Um, we have three board members tonight with us. Um, we, we did it a little bit differently this year. Uh, typically we have the whole board, but we wanted to give the board a chance to review less applications so that they could go deeper into the applications. And so we, uh, what we did this year is we let board members choose the priority areas that they were interested in. And then we, um, we, so we divided that up. So we have less board members per application, but hopefully not having to read all of them will give them a chance to take <laughs> the deeper dive into each of the ones that they are assigned. Um, so I will be a timekeeper. You will have 15 minutes before we start. I will of course let you introduce yourselves and then we'll start with the Q and A. If there's any time left at, after that 15 minutes, we'll go ahead and, and, and turn it over to you if you wanna share anything with the, with the board. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves um, and then we can start with the timer. Great. Well, hello, my name is Kim De Silva, and I'm the CEO at Community Food Share. And my name is Alexandra Lynch and I'm the grants administrator at Community Food Share. Awesome. Um, so let me get back to the timer here and I'm gonna go ahead and start. Does any of the board members have any questions for Community Food Share? Go ahead, Deanna. I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about um, sort of trends you're seeing in terms of demand. I know obviously inflation is a huge issue for people right now and that's and the cost of food. So I'm just curious how that's playing out in terms of people accessing your services and what you're seeing in terms of the trends. Yeah, absolutely. Since um, since late January, we've seen about a 35% increase in people accessing uh, our services through our pantry, uh, both on site and our mobile pantries. Our partner agencies are saying the same thing. Um, for some partner agencies, and even for us at times, it is more people than we saw at the height of the pandemic. And that would be because there are less programs and less money out there for the individuals who need it. But Inflation, uh, it fundamentally hits the people living paycheck to paycheck. 
So the last time that I looked, right now we're up to $480. Uh, that is the difference between what you would need this year than what you needed last year for the same exact thing. Um, and we currently do not see that diminishing anytime soon. And for us, but on top of supply chain issues and purchasing more food, uh, for us, this is actually a really challenging time and making sure that we're meeting the needs of our community. And I would just follow up uh, by saying, you know, Longmont uh, is uh, al already uh, our um, best customer, uh, Longmont Older Adults for our Elder Share program. And um, since the beginning of this year, um, we've just really seen a, an exponential increase in the number of older adults because, you know, those folks are living on a tighter margins even than paycheck to paycheck. And um, there's, just a lot of need, I think, in the community, in Longmont specifically. And I think honestly, you know, the next six months are the worst is still to come because people are gonna have to start paying those uh, XL bills that are going up by 54%. And um, I don't see, I, I, from what I've read, I don't see the pr cost of food um, coming down anytime soon. So I think those are the trends that we are seeing. So um, I have some questions too. Oh, Brian, if you want to go next, that's fine. Yeah, I apologize. It's a little awkward on audio. Um, hi, this is Brian Copham, and I'm sorry I'm not on video. I've got stuck in traffic, so uh, I'll be on video soon. Uh, what I'm wondering, and hi, Kim, nice to hear you again. Uh, yes. I'm wondering about the, the extra food access funding that's coming in, like through the LFPA program and things like that. Are those creating any positive structural changes that you feel are gonna impact delivery, service delivery in Longmont? Uh, I imagine they also create some stress in accommodating the extra sourcing and those kinds of things. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we just got notice a little bit ago a couple of weeks ago that we did get the LFPA uh, funding and we just went through the training of the funding um, and it's a reimbursement program. So once we connect with those local uh, farmers and co-ops and are able to get that food, then we'll be reimbursed for it. I think it, you know, the intent is that we strengthen the relationship between local nonprofits, farmers, co-ops, really small, uh, marginalized uh, businesses. And I think it, it will be successful, but I think it's going to take a little while for it to actually get some ground because we're still in the training session. So I imagine as we turn into January um, of this upcoming year, agencies, community food share being one of them, will start to do the actual uh, buying of uh, products and getting it back out into the community. And it's going to be at a absolutely um, pivotal time. When I was talking to my COO about this uh, yesterday, he is coming to the conclusion that we'll probably use a lot of that money for meat purchase because our uh, donations of meat and proteins, which are really what our community is needing, are down dramatically. So we're going to use the grant uh, and this grant specifically to help boost up that meat and protein. Uh, so we are optimistic about it, but since it hasn't run yet, we don't know exactly what uh, road bumps we'll experience during this program. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I'm going to, I I'm, I always caveat my questions because, you know, uh, the board and staff both see the same applications, but the board um, reviews different aspects of the application than the staff reviews. Primarily staff, I, I focus on uh, your strategic goals and planning and seeing that the, that the agency is, think, is looking like, you, we just talked a little about looking into the future and ensuring that they're gonna be able to deliver services. I also look at board diversity, the board does as well. And first I wanna give you kudos, 28% of your board, that's that's an increase is, is people of color. So that's great, thank you for, that's important to us. So to see that continued growth is important. 
Um, but I also look at your reserves and I look at your financials. And I mean, I have in my notes that the agencies, you know, your your audits looks like you've been pretty good, uh, pretty good position the last few years. It does talk about, you know, in your in your narrative on the reserves, talks about uh, needing to that you have a very good reserve. But but your twenty three projected budget is going to be taking quite a chunk of that reserve. Yeah, and so just love to hear about what strategically you're thinking about how to replenish that. Even though, as I said, you have a very healthy reserve as ba based yeah. on your on your application. I just want to hear a little more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we knew coming into this fiscal year, we actually thought it was going to be beginning last fiscal year that we would see a decline in donors that were giving during the pandemic. Um, and then of course we had the Marshall fires and a lot of funding from corporations uh, went to Marshall uh, fire funding, which was needed for the community. So when we went into this budgeting season, we budgeted about, once you also add in some of the capital, about 700 plus thousand dollars of reserves that we would use this year. So planning out, it's we're planning on using, you know, in that 700,000 mark this year, diminishing that uh, by increasing our fundraising through different revenue streams, including some plan giving programs, some mid and major programs, looking more at some federal state and government funding that may be out there for us. Uh, but we do see the next three years, we're probably going to have to dip into our reserve before we get to that break even point again. And for us, it was really important that we invest in staffing for community food share so that we can continue our work and our mission in the community. And that is where a lot of the, uh, um, overage is in terms of using our reserves. So I think out of that 700,000, um, about half a million is in staffing uh, to make sure that we have the people and that they're paid fairly and equitably. Uh, as we saw during um, the pandemic that became frontline that we need to invest in our staff so that we can invest in the community and looking at those programs of more deliveries and you know, right now we're taking a look at uh, increased delivery fees with uh, the cost of diesel fuel and the cost of getting the uh, 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 product uh, warehoused into our facility. So, yeah, I mean, it is a large chunk. Nobody ever likes to see us like going into our reserves, especially us, but the community really supported us and we want to use that to make sure that we're then providing the best service to the community uh for our mission so so that actually your what you just said brings up another question because that, that i've had with other nonprofits and just love to get your perspective um and we're, and we're having this issue at the city as well and that and, and that is of course staffing and the, and the workforce yeah. shortage and i love to hear you know how that has impacted clients if if at all um you know yeah for example like <laughs> have you had to shorten hour like i know i I got to my favorite restaurant a couple of times and they're like, oh, sorry, we're closed due to staffing. So I'm just wondering yeah. if, if that's having any impact uh, on your services as well. Well, I'll tell you, it is, uh, we went through this summer, it was really tough for us. At one point we were down about six employees, frontline employees, uh, but we did not actually shorten any of our hours or have our programs suffer we took people from other departments and filled in holes. So we spent a lot of time plugging holes with employees and volunteers because we knew that there was no way that we could just shorten hours or decide we're not gonna do mobile pantries um, or you know, not have an elder share delivery. So it was really stressful and a lot of our team worked really hard, but they were getting to that burnout point that we also talk about with how long could we sustain uh, plugging multiple holes. And luckily, just within the last two months, all of the positions that were open have been filled. Um, so now we're at a max, we have one position I believe we're hiring. And then other than that, we have every position that's been filled. So we're very fortunate because it was a hard, hard summer. All right. Um... Anybody else have any other questions for community food chair? 
All right, so we got about three minutes left. So that's great for you all. Um, if you want to share uh, some upcoming news or something that uh, yeah. you think is important for the board <laughs> and the community to hear, that this is the, I'm not sure how many folks watch our YouTube channel, but it's, you never know. <laughs> well, if they do, one of the things that I would like to uh, talk about is that we are actually at the beginning of January starting our strategic plan refresh. Uh, when I started in 2019, I came in on a strategic plan that was in the um, that had been rolled out a year or two prior, and now we're coming to the end of that in June of 2023. So we will be reaching out, doing focus groups, doing uh, uh, focus groups with funders, with uh, clients, with volunteers, community members. So if anybody is watching this and is interested in uh, becoming part of some of our focus groups as we look at what to really focus on these next three years, uh, just reach out because we'd love to have it. The more input, the better. And I would just add if anybody out there on YouTube watches this and knows somebody who needs help with food or if you need help with food yourself, give Community Food Share a call at 303-652. 3663 or go to www.communityfoodshare.org. Actually, that brought up a question for me, right? I mean, you, are, you all are the prime or the main suppliers for many of our local food pantries. And I've been hearing from our food pantries just the increase that they've had recently. And I'm wondering, is there, in, in part of your strategic planning, conversation is there going to be because here's the other so two things one is there going to be conversations happening with you and your and 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 just the, the the folks that you partner with here and then the other question is you, you mentioned elder share and again i do read the program piece but I don't, i'm not as well versed as the board members um i know that there's several folks now doing some type of home i mean of course long lot meals owners have done it for for years is there any conversations about collaborating or coordinating. I know like the farmer's market's now delivering food. You know, uh, uh, there's some other, the grocery, the what's called Boulder County Care Connect. They've had their, their grocery program for some time. I'm just wondering if there's any conversations at that level of coordination or collaboration about yeah. the delivery process. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great point. Right now, what we see is home delivery did, uh, increased dramatically during the pandemic for many agencies. Um, and right now, I think all of us as agencies are trying to figure out what is the best route for doing these home deliveries, because many organizations cannot handle large caseloads. And what we're seeing is increasing amounts of individuals who want home delivery, not only elder share, but individuals who are homebound or unable to get out. So we are working, especially through the food security network of taking a look at trying to coordinate what's happening within the community, who's doing it, where is there some synergies uh, that we can join forces. So that's gonna be part of our strategic talks as well. Um, and with our partner agencies, yes, you know, everybody is seeing increased uh, need. And so how are we making sure that we're not missing people uh, one of the big things that we're looking at is how do we provide services where people are at instead of having them come to places? What does that look like in the future? Um, so it's a great point. Um, and we have so many organizations doing such great things uh, and making sure that we're doing it the most effective manner we can is I think ongoing conversations uh, until we can really get, if you will, almost a heat map of services. Right, that that's a great idea, and I know I know that you all have CFS has taken the lead on that kind of stuff in the past. I love to see that leadership continue. I'd be happy to be part of any of those conferences. Because we just heard from you know one agency that's delivering you know fruits and vegetables, and and you know so yeah, I, I think that's a great a great service that it, that you know that we could work on collaboration and coordination because I know that it has increased and, and we see we're seeing it in our applications people asking for that so yeah. okay yeah no i would i would love that i'll keep you in mind because i think uh we have a new research person 
who started and she's really great at like uh, taking on some of these projects. Uh, so yes, we'll keep you in the loop. Yeah, please. I'd be, I'd be love to be uh, That's part of my, my role here is to help collaborations and coordinations. It's one of my passions. So please keep me in mind and I'd be love to help. All awesome. right. And we have spent our time. Thank you so much for all that you do. And thank you for being here tonight. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much, Alberto. Thank you. Bye. Right. Thank, Bye. You. thank you. Yeah, just notice that, you know, we're going to we're going to hear from, you know, I think Via is, of course, working with with the farmers market, but they're they're applying once again for their food delivery, their 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 vegetable fruit and, you know, fresh fruit delivery. So I'm wondering if there's any conversation going on on, on well, how should, should we be collaborating? Should we be working together? Should we ensure that we're not duplicating services? I'm not sure if those conversations are, are happening. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, especially with such limited resources, right? Ellie Go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, yeah, Brian. I, I was just going to say, sorry. For, uh, historically, I from a, I don't know what happened, you know, most recently, but those conversations were not happening a year ago. Also, wonder if it if the opportunities maybe aren't necessarily between, for instance, uh, food delivery or food organizations as much as they are between like food and medicine in an area or other services that are being delivered that could be joined up because I'm guessing customers choose more or less which provider they go with. I don't know though, it's definitely would be worth, be terrific to have that map. Right. Yeah. And again, I, I, for example, you know, CFS is doing elder chair, whereas the farmer's market is doing WIC, WIC clients, very different. So I also want to acknowledge that there, there could be different populations that are being served. Right. So that we have to acknowledge that. And I don't want to downplay that, but if there are lessons learned, if there are ways to, to coordinate or collaborate, to make it, you know, more effective and efficient then I, I don't, I think if those conversations aren't happening, they should. Now, our next folks should be here. Brenda, did we get a commitment from them? Oh, they're in the waiting room. Look at that, right on time. All right, let's let them in. I think there should be one more representative, but. Okay, all right, that's fine. I'm not sure who we're, we're talking to from Growing Gardens. I'm not sure if you could turn your camera on or change your name to see who. Oh, Vanessa. Okay, good. I'm working on all of those things. Thank you. Here I am. <laughs> no worries. Uh, do you have anyone else coming, Vanessa? Are we, are we to, uh, oh, we there's do. a Tim. I've got a, I've got a board member coming and then um, Tim, who is our um, farm manager. So they were having trouble with the link. So I just sent it to them. Okay, so Tim is on. Great. Um, let me make sure Carl has the link too. Okay. Hey, Tim, good evening. Good evening. Great, let me see. I think that should get her in too. Okay. Hopefully she joins us here in a second. Yeah, we could also start, Alberto. I know you. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let, well, let, let me give my let me give my my housekeeping spiel first, um, right. and then we'll we'll let um, them in when they when they uh, arrive. So first of all, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things to 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 share. Uh, First and foremost, this is a public hearing, so it will go on our. So it's being recorded and will go on our YouTube, our YouTube channel. Um, typically, we 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 did we did, did we did this process a little different this year. I, I know in the past you've come and you've seen a whole bunch of folks uh, on either on in person or on the screen. This year we decided to give 
um, board members the opportunity to choose the priority areas that they were most interested in. Uh, and so, you know, our members got to choose that, and that way they have to read less applications with the ultimate desire or outcome is that if you read less applications, it gives you a chance to dive deeper into the applications mm -hmm. to, to, to think more critically and have more questions. Um, so that's how we did that. Um, as usual, though, you will get your 15 minutes, and if at the end of the 15 minutes there is still uh, time after it's primarily question and answer. Mm -hmm. So if there is time at the end of the 15 minutes, we will turn it over to you so you can share whatever you like. Uh, so our board members tonight are Robert Putnam, Deanna Blair, and Brian Copham. Um, we're going to allow you to introduce yourselves. And once we do that, I'll go ahead and start the timer. Great. Hi, I can go first. My name is Vanessa Keeley. I prefer she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director for Growing Gardens. Um, I've been here for 21 years, and I'm excited to see all you tonight. Thank you. I think Catalina's in the waiting room. We're going to get her in. Oh, great. Thank you. Great. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Tim Villard. I use he, him pronouns, and this is my second year with Growing Gardens. I am our food project manager, which means I manage our food access programs, and a large portion of that is dedicated to my role also as the, the farm manager at our farm here in Longmont. Awesome. And Carl, right. we're just doing introductions. And so I think you're up next. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Carolina Neddy and I am group of uh, part of a community group in Longmont. Thank you for joining us tonight, Carolina. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start the timer and then uh, there will be questions from either myself as staff or from the board. All right, here we go. Does the board wanna start with any questions? Ali Berto, can I start with one? Yes. Okay, and this is Brian. Uh, sorry, I'm not on video. I hope to be soon. Uh, nice to hear your voices. And I'm wondering, this is kind of a trend question, in terms of the desired outcomes of the Longmont programming, do you feel that you're seeing progression in the quality of outcomes? Uh, or is it, you know, that you're able to serve more people? I, I guess I'm wondering what kind of growth you're seeing when it comes to the outcomes that you're measuring. Yeah, I think, um, Tim, why don't we let you speak to this, but I know one of the things we've been trying to do now that we've been on that farm for longer is to have more direct and deep connections with individuals and groups so that we're not giving as much produce to the food banks in Longmont, but they were having people um, with their families come out to the farm multiple times during the season and have more of a participatory role, um, both in growing food and then taking it home. Yeah. Um... Yeah, thanks, Brian. Great question. Uh, Vanessa, that's the direction I'd take that as well. So th as this be as this is my second year on the farm, um, and I while I have lived in the county for, for quite some time, um, you know, in any role, you deepen your, those relationships uh, over time. So um, I guess that has been the main thing is I met a lot of people through the farm last year. Some of those folks had been on the farm one or many years prior to that. And so um, that was, I was newer and fresher than them to the farm. Similarly with a lot of our partner relationships, uh, they knew us by reputation more than me. And so uh, that's been, I think the, the biggest thing and the trend is getting to know organizations better and what their needs are and just, or just their, schedules and what times for food drop-offs or when they can come, what works best for them, working to accommodate those folks. Similarly, same thing for individuals coming onto the farm um, <clears throat> and learning where to best advertise and where to, um, how to connect with folks and, and how to improve our programs and their experience on the farm. So um, there's all that, you know, at the end of last season, we, we, 
surveyed the participants on farm as well as organizations. What food did you enjoy eating most? Uh, what food were you least interested in eating and how can we adjust our growing plan to meet, uh, to meet your needs better? Uh, so that's, those are the things coming off of, out of my head right now, first off. Vanessa, anything or Garland? You know, I, I, will, I will say, uh, Brian, the other thing I wanted to add is that our, our preschool programming is relatively new. Um, that's something that the city of Longmont funded last year um, for us on that Longmont farm. And I think that part is really exciting for me when I think about outcomes, um, just all of the benefits of reaching children younger, um, I think is really exciting and starting being able to start with a preschool level is something we hadn't done before. And that's something that I'm really excited. Tim has, uh, we have three preschools that are walking distance to the Longmont Farm, um, the Wild Plum Preschool, there's the Inspire Preschool at the Y, and then the Timberline Preschool. Um, so we've done a lot more programming with those children and their families this year. And that I feel like is a good, a good way that our outcomes are gonna have more in impact. Great, thank you, appreciate it. Go ahead, Deanna. Uh, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about what you think your biggest challenge that you're facing. Is it staffing? Is it reaching customers? Is it funding? I know that's a pretty big umbrella question, but I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. We, we have an easy answer, Deanna. Um, the YMCA is excitingly um, installing a turf field so that they can do um, youth recreation in Longmont, which is, there's been a need for for a long time for um, affordable recreation for kids. Um, but that is gonna take up part of our farm in Longmont. So our biggest challenge this winter um, is working with the Y to reconfigure our space out there. We're gonna be opening up a new area for farming um, and kind of reconfiguring some of our existing space to be more efficient. Um, and we're also looking at partnering with some other um, groups in Longmont. Specifically, there's um, a couple churches that we're in contact with who are interested in using some of their land as a donation-based education farm, similar to what we've done um, with the Y. So that's that's probably our biggest challenge for this upcoming year is a lot of reconfiguration of our farm space. Thank you. That was not what I expected. So I was, I'm <laughs> glad I asked the question. It was an interesting yeah. answer. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I always caveat my questions because, um, you know, the board and staff review the same application. Uh, but we look at different aspects of the application where the board is looking at the programs and uh, and your outcomes, like what Brian was asking about. Staff looks more at your agency level, um, more around your board diversity, more around your finances, et cetera. Uh, first thing I want to do is, is, is give you kudos. Uh, this, this organization has done a great job of increasing the diversity on your board. So they start, so your board starts reflecting the folks that you are helping. And so I wanna give you kudos, kudos for that. Um, the question that I had though, um, and I'm going back and looking at my notes, is that when, you know, in, in that first question that we ask on the application, we ask for strategic goals. And you mentioned some really large, good, I mean, they're, they're, they're strategic goals, they're kind of broader, community-wide strategic goals. And I would love to know if you have any, you know, I think I just heard one, uh, figure out the uh, farm in Longmont. Um, love to hear if you have any other strategic goals that are more agency level, whether it be continue the diversifying of funding, whether it be, what else are you thinking about in Longmont that, uh, that are part of your strategic planning process? Um, are you looking for bigger goals, Olivia, or, or more? I'm, I'm looking for not, okay. So I'm not looking for programmatic goals. I'm looking for agency level goals, like you know. And then I I do have some questions about the programmatic piece because of what you just said about your your child your early childhood stuff. But I want to go first to think about what are your agency level strategic goals that that you think we should know about. Yeah, I mean, agency level goals, I think one of the things that we're that we're trying to do a lot of work and thinking about um, is how we are being more inclusive, more equitable um, and bringing in more diversity with the programs that we have on our farm. Um, we're in, looking to hire um, a person that would be a DEI coordinator for the organization to specifically help build some of those bridges 
more intentionally. Um, and I think that's that's something we're excited about. I feel like we've been talking a lot about our DEI goals, and now we're really trying to, you know, put some more funding and some more resources that the organization has behind them and put it into a specific person's role. Um, I feel like we, yeah, this is sort of how it's happened with our nonprofit is our staff is really excited and committed, but depending on what else is going on, we may spend a lot of time working on it, and then we may not be able to touch it for a while because there are other things happening. So we, we're really as an organization trying to put some consistency into that position and have it be a staff level position that can steward our efforts um, through that, both externally with um, building bridges with community members, with populations um, around the farm, with people of color, um, and then also internally what we can do with some of our, our practices and policies. Um, and sort of website accessibility, those types of things. Okay. And then I guess my my the question that just popped up because I heard you talking about this. And again, not that I don't read the program pieces, but I focus much more on the agency level piece. You know, you talked about working with early childhood education. And there's another program that we just heard about tonight uh, where, you know, fruit and veg boxes are delivered to 25 different ECEs. And um, just wondering, is there's any conversations at at the at the at the level of our our food producers around collaboration or coordination um, when it comes to these outreach programs? That's a really good question, um, Tim. Do you want to talk about that? I can I can also do it, but I don't know if you have a different take, maybe. Yeah. I can I can do my best, um, and I'll start I'll start with my history of just meeting some of these folks at Wild, Plum, in particular at Wild Plum Center, Timberline, and the Inspire Pre K. We have um, so just since since I started, we've gotten the kids out from the Inspire Pre K on site with the YMCA. Uh, if their schedule allowed, there was a classroom on the farm every single week for a tour, a tasting, um, and uh, and that was during the growing season. We actually, prior to that, we had our nutrition education um, staff member out in the classroom prior to the growing season, um, also quite regularly. Uh, I, I think she was in Longmont weekly, if not almost weekly, um, Inspire Pre-K being a really important relationship there. She's also worked a lot with Wild Plum Center, and they have also, um, well, all of those locations, the pre-K have been on site and received produce um, multiple times this year, as well as having um, uh, Rachel, who's our nutrition education staff member out working with them. So with those relationships, I hope that speaks to just the, the deepening and the continuation and investment in those relationships. In terms of coordinating more broadly with other producers, um, personally, um, part of my role with Growing Gardens has put me in um, the food security network for Boulder and Broomfield County. So that is how I, I have met a lot of folks um, who are not producers, but who, who are distributing the food to folks who need it most. Um, and so, yeah, I think Vanessa, please feel free to to jump well, on. Yeah. So, so, so let me be more more specific. Um, we just heard earlier tonight from Boulder County Farmers Market, right? And part of the, their application, at least one of their programs, is they run the, you know, farm to ECE program. And so, you know, they work with Boulder Public Health to to get into these, and they got twenty five um, early childhood centers that they work with. And so I just again, I just was just wanted to know if there's any conversations happening at that, you know, at that coordination collaboration. They'll say, oh, so if you're working with Wild Plum, you know, um, you know, we're working with Wild Plum. Is there any any of the, those type of meetings or talks happening? Yeah, I think that um, a lot of that coordination is done through through Boulder County Public Health, since it's the the farm to EC program is sort of the the way that we're all entering these preschools. Okay. 
Um, so we provide the plant starts for a lot of the preschools in the spring. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think a lot, a lot more can probably be done in that space about finding out what other organizations are doing and, and how we can um, really impact, you know, or how we can work together to provide the most impact. Um, I, I think though, yeah, I think most of it's happening through Boulder County, um, but I do think maybe that could be a pointed question for them is like, you know, can we have a meeting with all the people who are participating in this farm to ECE program? Um, you know, we have these, we have our position in it, and but what are other people doing and what are we doing with specific schools and what other schools are not getting that sort of level of outreach um, to see what kind of gaps there may be. Yeah, our, if I could tag on to the end of that, our other participation with the countywide Farm to ECE network is uh, season seedlings for their gardens in the spring. So uh, we we, in the spring for seed and seedling distribution, we do work closely um, with the EC network. And uh, this year and last year distributed seeds and seedlings to 75 um, ECE centers in the county th through that network. And that's been, um, at least from my position, the, the bulk of our coordination with them but we have a great relationship with that group as well. And um, yeah, the, the platform is set to continue that, to, to deepen that relationship as well, so. Okay, so we got about 30 seconds left. Uh, unless the board has any other questions, I'll turn it over to you all to see if you would give you the last word. Caro, since we've asked you to come tonight as a board member, do you want to share a story of maybe your Longmont group or your group visiting the Longmont farm this summer? Yes, I wanted to share that, that um, I've been part of this community group. Um, we were in another organization, but then uh, engaged with the farm. And now I'm part of the board of the Growing Gardens. And a lot of things happen, a lot of things with experience of these families and they change their habits um, of, of, of food. Uh, but for example, they said, oh, the salad tastes different, you know, and that is access to real and um, fresh and delicious food for them. So uh, we, have, we, we have like 15 families, like 40 kids, 45 kids. And we have cherry not only, we know, we learn not only to plant and harvest, we also share a lot of food traditions with, 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 with team in the farm and we love to eat. So every time that we would plan things like that and, and they really feel part of the farm, you know, they did a, a, a great connection with the land, with the plants, with the place. So I think that's it, what I want to share with you. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here tonight and for what you do for, for, for the city of Longmont residents that, that need your services. Appreciate it. Have, have a good rest of your night. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Nice thank to you. see you. Bye. All right. And our last group is going to be an early night tonight for you all. Um, our last group is already in the waiting room. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Katie. Hi, Carla. Hi. How are you? Good, good. Welcome tonight. Thank you for being here. I'm just going to go over some housekeeping uh, stuff and then we're going to get started. So first and foremost, thank you for being here. This is a public hearing, so it is being recorded and will be on the city's YouTube channel at some point. Um, we have three board members tonight, Robert, Deanna, and, and Brian, and this is a little different than what we've done in the past. Um, and the reason we did it is the board had a conversation about, you know, when you're reading, I don't know, 50, 60 application, it's hard to dig deep into the, each application. Mm -hmm. And so we decided this year to shift it a bit and say, all right, you just get to choose your priority areas and you get to read a lot less. But we the expectation is if you're not reading as many, then you're going to read them closer and, and have some more, you know, some deeper conversations 
uh, with our applicants about the application. And, and so far, I've been very pleased with that. Our board members have had the chance to dig deeper and, and have some good questions. Um, so as usual, you'll have 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, at the end of those 15 minutes, if there's still time, we will turn it over to you for you to share whatever you want to share. Um, and we will get started after you all introduce your, yourselves. Well, I'll go first. I am <laughs> Carla Hale, and I'm the Executive Director with Longmont Meals on Wheels. And I'm Katie Weiser, and I'm Development and Communications Director, and I'm the grant writer, too. So if there's any grammar, that's on me. All right. All right, let's go ahead and get started <laughs> now. Does anybody have any questions that they want to start off with Longmont Meals on Wheels? If not, I do, but OK, Brian. Sorry, now I'm on video, I can raise my hand. Uh, so, you know, I think every year I come to this point where it's like, oh, well, this is one of the easier applications to review just because it's very consistent and you do such a great job with your delivery. And, uh, but I do, I'm wondering, based on what you've seen the last couple of years and what you're asking for for next year, what do you think the trend, because we do these on a yearly basis, like if, if we were doing a multi-year award, what kind of trend would you be looking at for, do you think you're, you're asking it's going to be increasing annually or uh, what do you expect your request rather? Very good question. Um, because, um, I mean, as you know, the pandemic hit our population of the folks we serve you know, first and, and kind of hardest. And so, um, you know, it, it's been hard to kind of predict what's coming next. Um, and in 2020, um, you know, people, we, we served fewer people, um, you know, over the course of the year, the first month or two, our numbers went way up. And then as people figured out what their long-term plans were for the pandemic, the number of clients we were serving went down, but the, the numbers of meals we were serving went up and those people just needed more intense help. And then the last, and then 2021 and so far this year, um, you know, we can't really explain our trends fully because there's not great data out nationally yet as to what happened to the senior population, but things are shifting and there's fewer clients. Um, the clients that we have still seem to need us more intensely you know, we're operating on, on the hope that it's, that it's us, that we've missed two years of outreach opportunity. And, you know, as, as people pass away or need to move into assisted living facilities or move in with family, normally there's, you know, the next population to kind of replace them. And we're hoping that we just miss those two years of opportunities. And so we're doing very intense outreach this year. We have seen some national trending data about um, the people are, are kind of turning towards multi-generational living a little bit more, which is great. Um, we can support people in, their, in, any, in that kind of situation with meals and wellness checks during the day. So we certainly hope that's it, but we also suspect that we, we did lose some people. We know that we had high death rates in 2020 due to COVID and in 2021 due to all the things that people had been putting off going to see their doctor about in 2020. Um, and then we lost a lot of folks in 2021 who also were delayed as long as possible moving into assisted living facilities. Um, and then as soon as they could be fully vaccinated, they, they made that decision. And so, we're going to continue to operate that it's missed outreach because it's the only one that we can control um and so we're working really hard on that um ads in the newspaper um you know changing up our service model back to um doing um uh, special diet needs and things like that. And so we're starting to see our numbers go up, especially in-person dining. In-person dining was really the one that has really been lagging this year. In fact, we thought about like, is just this model not here anymore? Is there no need anymore? And today we have 55 people show up for lunch, which is pre-pandemic numbers. So all of a sudden in-person dining is really starting to turn around. Um, but we just seem to be missing those 
some of the at home population and we're hoping that it's just missed outreach opportunities and so we're going to continue to chug away and um, brighten our services and improve our services and advertise that fact so that folks are you know know that we're here and know that we're working on improving things and helping them out so we think what we what we've been seeing as a result of outreach and advertising is that um, trends are starting to move back up yet but we don't know if that's consistent yet carla am i, am I missing anything no, I don't think you really are. I think one of the things that Katie and I have talked about a lot too is that our population has become more isolated than they were before. So there's many of them, they don't get on the computer, they don't get the newspaper, they don't see a lot of that advertising. Um, so how do we reach them and how do we get the word out that we're there also for them? So that is another piece of it that we're working on. But I think you, I think you got everything else. Thank you both, appreciate it. So, I want to make sure I want to make sure and defer to the board. Do they have any questions? Because I, I, of course, I have questions. Um, uh, so, so I think my, I always I've been caveating my questions with all our agencies. You know, we all review the same application, but board and staff look at different things, right? So, board is looking at your program, at your at your at your metrics, at your all of that kind of of things, not that I don't look at it, but I focus my questions on the things that I'm responsible for. And primarily what I look at is your strategic planning, your board diversity, and your financial situation. And I had a couple of questions. Um, you know, I, I we have a question in the application about annual reserves, and I didn't see anything. So I'd like to hear a little more about how you you handle, you know, your reserve situation uh, for four times when, you know, we all know times can get tough for nonprofits. So I'd love to learn a little more about that. Do you want me to take that, Katie? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing that um, the board has done is we have put together two funds, a catastrophe fund, and then also a fund that's supposed to be used for any type of um, capital campaign or even for us to grow, use it for equipment, that type of thing. Um, so that is where two of our big funds are is right there, is money that we're saving. Um, also, <coughs> I am so sorry, I have a really bad cold, so sorry. Um, and so those are two of the areas that the board has been looking into and seeing if that we can maybe even utilize those areas a little bit more, add a little bit more funding to those areas. We're also looking at the funds that we have right now and see if there is places that we maybe wanna move some of those funds so we can get a little bit better interest rate on, on the funds that we have. Does that help? Yeah, that yeah, that's, okay. yeah, that's yeah. helpful because yeah, the application itself, <clears throat> didn't have have much on so that's why i just wanted to follow get a little bit deeper on that yeah um, and i think we actually have talked about that before it's not yeah. something that we have a whole lot of that on there um but it has it was one that we have a new auditor this year and um so that was something we had talked about too is really kind of showing those funds a little bit better so okay great thank you yeah that, that's helpful um and i think i already heard this already i mean what what, what katie just talked about the the outreach piece is I'm sure part of your strategic work for this year. Any other strategic goals that you you want to share with us? Like, you know, uh, speaking of equipment or volunteers, anything else that's in the hopper for for the organization? Yeah. So in addition to very heavy duty outreach, we introduced a salad bar um, in person at the Longmont Senior Center three days a week. Um, that's brand new. We received um, a grant from the AAA to do that. Um, it's only Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because supply chain issues are such that we cannot guarantee the freshness of the salads on Mondays and Tuesdays. Our delivery comes in on Tuesday, and even so, sometimes we have to run out and scrounge around town before Wednesday because supply chain is just really inconsistent right now. Um, we also are... Um, we're working on moving back to um, special diet needs. And um, during the pandemic, because of the way we had to operate to make sure that staff was in as little contact with each other and with volunteers, and we had no volunteers in for a while, 
we had moved to a system of folks managing it um, on their own where they could call, um, you know, a day that the menu really worked for them and order extras and on days that they couldn't um, do take a meal, they just could call and cancel. And we, we made exceptions for folks with uh, cognition issues um, who didn't have people to help them. And we did that, but we're trying to expand um, back into that because we don't publish the sides ahead of time to allow for supply chain issues. And so, for example, if you're on a Coumadin diet, you're not allowed leafy greens, but you wouldn't know that. And so that kind of stuff we're, we're working on getting back to um and and cultural um significant diets as well you know no pork no no beef um you know fish on fridays if that's what you need so we've certainly reintroduced those things to um you know and then folks that can still manage it on their own we are really happy for that support right now because we are still down one person in the kitchen um and so that one is a little bit slower at rolling out than we would we would have hoped but we're working on it Strategic goals to involve, um, we are, we started during COVID a major technology upgrade. And I know I brought this up last year too, but it's still going on. <laughs> so the bulk of what we needed is done, but the reasons why we moved to this new company, we haven't reaped the extras yet. And so we're working on those things right now. So it is our um, program management software that also houses our, our client database. And that is all transitioned. It's working great. Staff understands how to use it. It's going well. The other reason why we chose this software is because of the volunteer management piece um, and tracking our volunteers, both their demographics, so that we can make sure that we're doing a great job of, of making sure that our clients see themselves reflected in our volunteer pool, but also, you know, just to be able to schedule them better without, you know, on a our, there was like one day that we had 13 people call off and then our program manager is spending half the day on the phone instead of being able to send out push notifications and things like that. So that is um, the next piece of, of our new software upgrades. Awesome. <laughs> Anything uh, else, Carla? <laughs> so actually, you, you first of all, you, you brought up delivery um, and, and you wrote it in your grant and I appreciate that where you talk about um, how there are other agencies delivering food stuff. Um, and we just had two or three agencies tonight talk about their home delivery type of thing. And my question to them, and, I, and I'm gonna I'll ask the same question to you, um, even though I think I think you, you all are unique and different than what they do. That being said, you have many years of doing this type of work, and I'm wondering if your expertise would be helpful. But the question that I asked them um, was, is there any conversations going on around coordination and collaboration of these type of services? Again, understanding that yours is very unique and different, but I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to, to see if there's, you know, if, 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 you know, if CFS, if community share is doing elder share delivering, uh, you know, those, those what, what they deliver, if VIA is delivering for the farmer's market, you know, if uh, Cultivate is doing their grocery pickup stuff, I'm just wondering if there's any place for conversations around coordination and collaboration. And I, and I don't know if there is, there might not be, but I'm just, I'm just asking the question. Yes, always. We talk about it a lot. Um... You know, Community Future has reached out to us a couple of times about in the past about doing their their um, their boxes. How many pounds are their boxes? Fifty pounds, Carla. I think so. Yeah, and so that has been one of the kind of determining factors at how well we can share because um, most of our volunteers are retirees, and so to have them and they're also going to when they're going out on a route, they're going to see ten to twenty four people per route. Also, the food has to be as hot at the end of the route as the beginning. So that creates all kinds of coordination issues where basically you'd have to kind of send out the 50 pound boxes separately anyway. Um, cultivate, you know, I think delivers their straight from the grocery store. Um, and so, you know, we've talked about that, but actually something really interesting just opened itself up to all of us nonprofit delivery folks, delivery of any type, food, 
clothes, anything like that. And I encourage you to share it to your other nonprofits because it's interesting. It's called Project Dash and it's run by DoorDash. They have not committed to it beyond 2023. So nonprofits have to be careful not to get too dependent on it. But basically they are offering delivery services for in-kind donation. And you just have to have 10 bags per um, minimum of 10 bags or boxes per calling in a, in a, one of their drivers. Yeah. And so we're actually looking at, can we expand to kind of some of those gray areas? Like every once in a while, we will get, you know, somebody who calls from a different Meals on Wheels delivery area that's just really struggling with, with how the services are working at a different Meals on Wheels. And if we have a volunteer that can go out there, great. But usually to get a volunteer to consistently go out further is hard. So this could open up opportunities to kind of get deliveries to folks to, if we know somebody has like no clothes in their house, to be able to send that out with somebody. Um, it it kind of expands things. And we, we were talking about, we don't know, we would have to see how this works, but we were talking, maybe we could even reach back out to Community Food Share and see if the boxes, these 50 pound boxes could go through paid employees to DoorDash instead of our volunteers who are older themselves. I just took the training on it the, last week, so this is all very new, but we were actually having this conversation last week, Alberto. Yeah. Awesome, that's, no, that's good to hear. Yeah, I mean, we just, like I said, we've been hearing it all night and so I was like, I'm just asking the question. Yeah. yeah. So all right, our, our timers are actually up. Again, I love this new smaller group because we get into these really deep conversations. But uh, board, if anybody has any, any other questions. All right. If not, I want to thank you all for your time tonight. Appreciate what you all do for our uh, city of Longmont residents that use your services. And, and I hope that your outreach efforts work and we get more folks on your services. Great. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you all for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. Night. Thanks, Katie. Bye-bye. Right. All right, folks. Um, got through another one. I have, I, like I said, I've really appreciated this new, this new model. Uh, we've had some, deep, deep conversations. And I appreciate your time. And um, just what I, what I, I'll, I, I'm going to try and send an email out tomorrow. We really need your scores by 1031. So by it, by the end of October, if you get them in before, that's fine. But 1031, because our, our deliberations meeting is November 10th. So we'll need to, I, I need a couple of weeks to get all that stuff compiled and et cetera. If anybody needs any help with Putting it if with the system, let Brenda, me, or Erica know. Thank, Thank you, Alberto. All right. Have a good night. You too. Good night, all. See you. Bye, everybody. Good night. Bye.